Okay, so welcome everyone to today's webinar session. I'm very much looking forward to the talk from Eleonora Camerona today on the role of pain expectancy and its confidence in placebo analgesia and nocebo hyperalgesia. Um, before we start, I would hand over with the introduction from one of our ECR speakers. Um, okay, so it's my great, uh, great pleasure sorry, to introduce Eleonora Camerona to you from the University of Oxford. After finishing her studies in um, psychology and neuroscience in uh, London, she started her PhD in neuroscience on the temporal component of placebo and nocebo effects at the University of Genova in 2017 and finished her PhD in, in uh, 2021. After that, she uh, moved to the University of uh, Milano as a postdoctoral researcher. And as we have been informed uh, today, uh, she recently moved to the University of Oxford. Her research topics are on body-mind interactions in the context of pain, um, the influence of expectations on pain onset and endurance, and cognitive regulation of pain. So um, today we will hear her talk about the role of pain expectancy and its confidence in placebo analgesia and nocebo hyperalgesia. Um, yeah, so uh, the stage is yours. We are very much looking forward to your talk. Thank you, Maren, for this very excellent uh, introduction. So um, I'm just going to share my screen. Okay, so, um, well, thank you for, for the introduction, as I was saying, and uh, I'm very excited to be here today to present uh, our latest research on the role of pain expectancy and its confidence in placebo analgesia and nocebo hyperalgesia. I don't know why it's not um, moving. Okay, so let's start by um, giving a bit of an introduction in order to better understand our data and place it in the correct theoretical framework. So some of you might have heard of the term the Bayesian brain. This is often used interchangeably with the term the predictive brain. And this is because perception, according to this model, um, is no longer seen just as being the result of uh, bottom-up inferences, but instead is actually the result of an interaction between bottom-up information and top-down predictions that the brain uh, makes, the brain generates. So in this case, the brain is an active um, element in the, in the perception context. And more precisely, what the Bayesian brain hypothesis uh, suggests is that this integration actually follows Bayes' rules. So what this means is that perception arises from the integration between the prior, which is the prediction that the brain makes, the sensory data, and the level of precision. So... Their level of precision in statistical terms, this is the inverse variance, but in more practical terms, what it means, um, this is just the level of the reliability of the data. So how much can I trust the data? But uh, let's have a look at this image here to, to get a better idea of, of this uh, Bayesian um, interaction. So here we have the sensory data, so the bottom-up information, and then we have the prior, so the prediction that the brain uh, generates. And the prior and the sensory data, as I was saying before, both have a level of precision, which is the width of the curve in this case. So the, 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 um, the wider the curve, the less precise, while the more steep the curve, the more precise. And as you can see here, the posterior, which is the percept, moves towards the, pri the prior, the more the prior it's certain, the more the prior is reliable. And the reason why this is important is because according to this framework, um, perception then gives much as much more, um, so the brain has much more power on modulating perception um, such that the, the, our perception is actually the brain best guess. And um, this is highly relevant, especially in terms of perceptual biases. So a perceptual bias is when we perceive something that's actually quite um far away from the sensory data, it's more skewed toward the prior. So I was just going to try to give um, a more practical example of the, the Bayesian framework, just by showing these two images here. So on the left-hand side, we can see a bright forest. Um, it's sunny, there is the light. And as you can see, there is like a snake just in the front. Uh, and here, the data is quite clear, it's quite reliable. So we can easily see um, everything in the forest. But then in the right-hand side, 
the image is much less um, precise, uh, it's much less clear. So it's foggy, it's dark, and it's still the same snake, but it's much more blurry. So this is just two examples, just to show that sensory data can be more or less precise. And uh, as well, as we were saying before, the prior also has, um, is also more or less precise depending on the context. So for example, if I'm in the UK walking in a forest, I'm not likely to expect to see um, a snake. Whereas if I'm in Australia, then I might be more prone to expect a snake. So this is just an example of how the prior can have a different uh, precision depending on where I am physically. Or another example would be if I'm highly terrified from snakes, then my prior of seeing a snake might be highly precise most of the times. So this is just a, um, a quick example to, to show you how different sensory data with different precisions and prior with different precision can interact and can actually influence the way uh, we might or might not see a snake while walking in the forest. We might be um, delayed in perceiving the snakes or mistaken it for a wooden stick or something. But uh, let's move back to the, the research context um, and talk about the main topic of this talk, which are placebo hypalgesia and nocebo hypalgesia. So these effects are great examples of bias, pain, uh, of bias perception. So precisely, um, most of you might have heard of placebo hypalgesia. So this is when you receive an inert treatment that's uh, presented as having analgesic properties. And this leads to a uh, decrease in pain perception due to the fact that you, are belie you believe that you have been given uh, an analgesic treatment. And the same is for hyperalgesia, so, but it's in the opposite direction. So the belief of being um, of having received a hyperalgesic uh, treatment leads to an increase in pain perception. So these are striking examples of how perception can be biased. And here um, in the right-hand side, we can see an image of the Bayesian brain applied to um, placebo hyperalgesia and nocebo hyperalgesia. So as you can see here, starting from the lower level of the image, uh, going upwards, you can see that the prior, which is my expectation, my prediction, that the treatment I've been given has analgesic or hyperalgesic properties, um, increases in its certainty. So in the higher up level, you can see the prior is very skewed. Uh, in this image, for simplicity reasons, I kept the noxious data fixed. So the precision of the noxious data is fixed. So what you can see here is this perceptual bias. So the posterior, which is the perceived pain, shifts toward the prior, the more the prior become precise. So this is just a graphical representation of the uh, Bayesian brain applied to placebo and nocebo context. And this has been uh, greatly outlined in um, several new um, reviews just published uh, in 2014 and in 2023. And this concept has just been very much welcomed in the placebo and nocebo community because it fits really well with this bias perception. However, and quite surprisingly, there is not much direct evidence demonstrated that, demonstrating that the Bayesian framework actually works in placebo and nocebo um, effects. Um, so just a quick overview of the um, evidence I, I came across while working in this, in this field. Um, so we have quite a bit of indirect evidence showing that the Bayesian framework is likely to be a good framework for uh, understanding placebo and nocebo effects. So I'm just going to go through a couple of studies very quickly. So in 20, 2001, there is this uh, study by Paul and colleagues um, here, they administered a placebo intervention to, to patients. And what they modulated here was the level, was the, was the um, verbal suggestions. But in one group, they gave more certain suggestions by saying, you will 100% receive the active treatment. And in the other group, they said, you have a 50% chance of receiving the active treatment. So in this study, they did not aim to test the Bayesian framework. It was a long time ago. The Bayesian framework was not very popular back then, uh, but so it was a completely different aim. But what they found is that placebo effects were stronger when the verbal suggestions were more certain. So what we can infer from this data is that it aligns with what we would expect from a Bayesian perspective. However, it's very much indirect evidence. Other studies um, on a similar line, so also they did not uh, aim to test the Bayesian framework, but their results align with the Bayesian framework, is the one by Young and colleague 2014. So here they um, elicited a placebo response using a conditioning procedure. Very quickly, just to present to those of you that are not familiar with this procedure, um, 
when you use a conditioning to elicit a placebo, what it means that you simply give um, an inert treatment and you associate this with a reduction in the in the stimulation. So in this experiment, for example, pain was elicited experimentally, and in the conditioning procedure, the stimuli were um, decreased by the experimenter without the participant knowing. So this um, is done to create an association between um, the expectation of having received a strong analgesic and the actual perceptual experience. So what they've done in this study was modulating the certainty of the conditioning by either doing a continuous conditioning. So all, um, in all the pain trials during the conditioning, the stimuli were reduced. Whereas in the partial conditioning, the stimuli were reduced only 60% of the cases. Um, so you can see here, this is a great way to mod it's a great way to modulate the prior. However, in this study, that was not really the aim. So they did not measure whether the prior was, was actually modulated in that sense, in, the, in terms of the precision. But what they found here, again, is that in the continuous um, conditioning, placebo analgesia was stronger. So this evidence aligns with the Bayesian framework, although it's not direct evidence because first, it was not the aim of the study. And secondly, they didn't measure the, the, the prior whether this was modulated. So we didn't have a tangible way to check whether the manipulation worked. Um, so moving on to the nocebo part, um, Collagiuri and colleagues have done a similar study of the one I just discussed from Young in 2014, but for the nocebo. So again, continuous conditioning, partial conditioning, but with a nocebo intervention. And here also they found evidence in support of the Bayesian framework, such that in the con continuous conditioning, placebo, uh, nocebo paralgesia was stronger. And again, indirect evidence. Finally, in this study by Coloca in 2010, they modulated, uh, so simply they gave a longer conditioning and a shorter conditioning. So they repeated the conditioning more times in one group and less times in the other. So also in this case, we could argue that repeating the conditioning multiple times could be a way to manipulate the prior, but again, this is just an inference that we are making. Um, however, in this study, they did not um, demonstrate that nocebo paralgesia was actually greater in the longer. So this does not really align with the Bayesian framework. The only study that I came across um, that directly tested the Bayesian framework, so more about direct evidence, is the one by Anchise and Zanon in 2015. Here, they elicited a placebo analgesic response uh, using a conditioning procedure, and they did test directly the Bayesian modeling. So they've done all these um, computational models to test um, whether the Bayesian framework was appropriate. And indeed, they found support for this model. Um, however, in this case, the prior precision was assumed from, a da from the data, so it was not directly measured. This is something I will go back to it later, but I just wanted to point this out. And finally, for the nocebo, there is not direct evidence that I'm aware of in terms of um, demonstrating the Bayesian framework. So going back to the, what I was saying from the study of Anchise and Zanon, they assumed the prior precision from the data, which is something that it's expected in that kind of um, analysis. However, something that has been done recently, um, especially in fields outside from placebo and nocebo, mostly in studies coming from few-based paradigms, which is slightly different because we don't give an inert treatment, but we simply modulate the expectation by giving different cues. Uh, so what they've done is actually looking at the vision perspective at a higher up level, so at the metacognitive level. And what does this mean is that the prior at the metacognitive, metacognitive level, it becomes someone's expectation. So what I expect is a conscious prediction. And then consequently, the prior precision uh, becomes the expectation confidence, the expectation precision. So how confident am I in my expectation? Um, so this has been giving very promising results in the pain modulation studies using Q-based paradigms. However, the metacognitive Bayesian framework has never been tested in placebo and nocebo uh, research, at least that I'm, aw I'm aware of. So moving on to our research goal, we, which draws from all of these introduction uh, notes, what we wanted to do in our study was to investigate whether placebo hypalgesia and nocebo hypalgesia can both be described under the same Bayesian framework assessed at the metacognitive level. So here, before moving on to the specific hypothesis of the study, I'm just going to show you a quick um, um, I just invite you to look at the image in terms of our hypothesis. So here we have the sensory data 
and we have a prior, which is our expectation, with a rather uh, wide pre um, precision or confidence. But as we move, the prior becomes more precise and the posterior, which is our percept, aligns, goes more towards the prior, goes more towards the expectation. So the posterior would be the pain perception. So accordingly, we developed two specific hypotheses that we, were going, that we tested with our experiment. So the first one is whether pain, so we're asking, our hypothesis is that pain is predicted by the interaction between the expectation and its precision. So what we expect is that pain, so the posterior, will be predicted by the two dimensions of the expectation. So the expectation itself, the magnitude of the expectation, and its width, in other words, its precision. Um, the second hypothesis, it's it's a, um, so these two hypotheses are two sides of the same coin, basically. So the second hypothesis is that the greater the expectation precision, the smaller the mismatch between what is expected and what is perceived. So it's a different way to, to say the same thing. So to just um, yeah, explain the Bayesian framework. And I will go back to this uh, once I will um, explain the analysis. But let's have a look at the experiment outline. So before going and delving into the test session, which is the bulk of our experiment, um, I'll give you a quick outlook. So of course, we got the informed consent from healthy participants to participate. Um, this is an experiment using um, electrical, electrical stimuli. So we elicited pain with electrical stimuli. Um, these stimuli were delivered on the right uh, index, uh, on the right finger of the non-dominant hand. And we also measured skin conductors response as a measure of um, physiological response of pain. So we would expect that the modulation of pain would be associated with differences in peak-to-peak -peak, um, activation. Uh, and then at the end, so we have the test session that I will discuss in a second, and then we gave some of the questionnaires at the end, um, looking at some psychological traits, and finally participants were debriefed. So. The test session is a um, classical uh, placebo and nocebo uh, experimental design. So we have a test session zero, so a baseline. Then participants are allocated to either the placebo group, the nocebo group, or the control, and then they repeat the pain test. Um, in this case, we used um, as a placebo and nocebo manipulation, we use something that we call SAIS, which is uh, like a fancy name that we made up for calling um, is a magnetotherapy device that you can see here on the, in the image. Uh, we delivered these in inert mode. So the parameters were set to null. So it was, it was not active. However, we told participants that this has had either strong hypoalgesic um, effects or hyperalgesic one, depending on the group allocation. Uh, whereas for the control group, we just told them that the, the machine was set to, to null parameters. And as you can see here in the image, uh, there is this little cushion that can be placed around the arm, which is exactly where we placed it in our experiment. And the cover story was that within this um, cushion, there are some magnets, and depending on the, on the values that we give to these uh, parameters, this influences the way that the, our brain, um, so the, uh, how the signal travels from the hand to the brain. Anyways, it's just a, a fancy story that we made up and it was also written in this uh, flyer just to make the story more, more believable. Um, but yeah, so we had in total uh, 60 participants, 20 for each group. Um, and this is pretty much the, the design. Delving in into the test session. So as you can see in the previous image, the test zero and test one is repeated twice. So let's have a look at what happens in each of these. So this test zero and test one are identical um, and the noxious stimuli, they were kept fixed at 2T, so two times the threshold. So, um, and this is quite important because then I, I will go back to it also later, but by keeping the noxious stimuli fixed, we were able um, to just focus on the influence of the prior in our analysis, because otherwise we would have to also take into account the variability of the noxious stimuli and of the sensory data, which would make it uh, more complicated. So this is um, quite important to keep, it mind, to keep in mind. Um, so again, um, participants were placed in front of a computer and the first prompt they received was to rate their expectations. So the first question it was asked was, how much pain do you expect from zero to 10? Where zero is no pain, 10 is unbearable pain. Participants replied just by giving one of the numbers on a keyboard and then precision was measured. 
by asking them how confident are you about your prediction of the expected pain intensity from zero to 10. So how, basically what we ask is how confident are you from about the previous expectations that you just gave. Then the noxious stimulus, stimulus was given and then pain was actually assessed. So how much pain have you experienced from zero to 10? And this was repeated eight times. So as you can see here, we have all the parameters that we need for our Bayesian uh, framework. We have the expectation and then we have the expectation precision. And this was done at T0 and at test one. Okay, so let's go um, through the analysis that we conducted. So we run a preliminary analysis. Uh, these are simply a manipulation check. First, to see that our experimental manipulation actually worked. So what we looked at was, were we able to elicit placebo and nocebo effects? Then we looked at, did we modulate expectations accordingly to the verbal suggestions that we gave? And then finally, we checked whether the autonomic response was associated with the pain modulation. And the way we um, addressed this question was by running three separate Bayesian linear mixed model analysis, um, which were um, uh, the same one to the other with the only difference being the dependent variable. So in the first one, we looked at the interaction effect, effect between group and session. So this was to look at the um, experimental manipulation, whether this worked. So whether this had an effect on pain, then in the second one, we looked at whether this interaction had an effect on expectation. And finally, whether this interaction had an effect on peak to peak. Um, using linear uh, mixed models, we were able to set the random effect variable uh, with ID, so individual uh, participants, and that allowed us to look at the um, um, group effects without, uh, but also maintaining the individual variances, which is um, a big strength of this type of analysis. And then we computed bias factor by um, comparing model one, so the full model with the interaction, with model two, which is the same model of model one without the interaction. So that's the only thing that changes. Then we conducted our main analysis, which is um, to address the main uh, research question of this research, of this study. Um, so do placebo analgesia and nocebo hyperalgesia follow by Bayesian rules? And to address this question, we ran two analyses, always, um, again, using Bayesian li linear mixed models. So the first one, and this is connected to our first hypothesis, is looking at pain predicted by expectation and precision by this interaction. So these, again, are the two dimensions of the prior, the expectation and its confidence. So from a Bayesian perspective, we would expect that this interaction predicts pain. Then in the second uh, main analysis, we looked at delta pain, which is a variable that we computed by looking at the absolute value um, of the difference between expectation and pain. So the discrepancy between what I expect and the pain I received in, in absolute value. So if I expect four and I receive pain of five, that would be one. So there is a discrepancy of one. And what we uh, predicted here is that precision, so how confident I am in my expectation, will predict the discrepancy between these two, will predict the delta pain. So um, let's have a look at the results. So I'm going to go in order by starting from the preliminary analysis, and I will talk you through um, all of them. So were there placebo and nocebo effects? Did our verbal suggestion actually work? And indeed, as you, as you can see from the graph here, um, they did work. So what we found is that the difference in pain perception in the nocebo group between T0 and T1 is much bigger than uh, compared to the control group that you can see here. And so as you can see at T0, pain uh, it's lower and at T1, pain is greater. So in the nocebo group, there is an, uh, an increase in pain perception. And then we found the same, uh, and the estimate for this difference um, is 0 0.50, uh, yeah, 0 0.53 with the, in, with the confidence intervals that you can see here in the table. Um, in terms of the placebo group, we found a similar effect, but in the opposite direction. So the difference at T0 and T1 of in, in terms of pain for the placebo group is bigger compared to the control group. And again, this is in the opposite direction. So from T0 to T1, pain actually decreases. And the estimate for this is 0 0.72 with the confidence intervals. Uh, we also computed the Bayesian factor that, as, as I mentioned earlier, um, arises from the comparison between the model with the interaction and the model without the interaction. 
And this supports our um, results by showing that the full model, so the model with, with the interaction, um, this uh, fits the data 48 times 0.67 times, sorry, 48.67 times better than the model without the, the interaction. So it's definitely um, a better fit. So what we can conclude from here is that our verbal suggestions uh, elicited placebo hyperalgesia and nocebo hyperalgesia. So then we run the same analysis, but with expectations. And what we found is here again, so on the x-axis, uh, you can see the expectations. And on the, um, sorry, on the y-axis, you can see the expectation. And on the group, you can see the, um, and on the x-axis, you can see the groups. Again, what we found is that the difference in terms of um, expectation between T0 and T1 is bigger for the nocebo group compared to the control of a value of 0 0.77 and the um, confident intervals. So again, here from T0 to T1, expectations of pain increased. Um, and in the placebo group, the difference between T0 and T1 um, is greater for the placebo group compared to the control. And again, there is a decrease in, in the expectation of minus uh, 0 0.056 and the confidence intervals. So, the, so then in the placebo group, after our verbal suggestions, the expectation of analgesia did arise. So to conclude for the, from this analysis, pain expectations were modulated coherently with suggestions of hypoalgesia and of hyperalgesia. In terms of uh, our um, skin conductance response analysis, we did not find an interaction effect. Uh, as we um, expected, but we did find uh, a session effect, which means that um, skin conduction, so we looked at the peak to peak, actually decreased over time. So decreased from test session zero and test session one. And the way we interpreted this is that um, this is due to an habituation effect, which is actually quite common when using skin conductance response in these types of paradigms. Uh, so we do have no evidence in support of an effect of our experimental manipulation on peak to peak. Uh, we do not know whether the effect is not there or whether it's just hidden by the habituation effect. And here you can see the, the bias factor of the model without the interaction compared to the model with the interaction is actually a lot better. So the, the model without the interaction is, is greatly better for the, for the data. But let's now move on to the... The, the main part of our analysis of our results, which are the ones looking at the Bayesian framework and whether this is a good description of our data. So the first analysis uh, allows us to answer the question, is pain predicted by the interaction uh, between, between the two um, dimensions of the prior, so the expectation and its precision? And as you can see from the graph and from the table here, we did find an, an interaction between expectation and precision. So here we have on the y-axis, we have pain, then we have expectation on the x-axis, and precision is coded in either blue, green, or red, depending on its precision. So red, it's less precision, green is average precision, and blue, it's higher precision. And what we found here is that for each unit, so we can be 95% confident that for each unit increase in expectation precision, the relationship between expectation and pain changes of a value of 0 0.03 with the confidence intervals um, outlined here. So as you can see, this is a very small effect. However, the effect is there and it's consistent. And if you look at the image, what we found here greatly aligns with the Bayesian framework. So greater the precision, so the blue lines, the greater the alignment between pain and expectations. So if you look at here, there is like a six and it's blue and it's more aligned with the expectation value compared to then um, expectation precision in red which is a lower precision so this is uh, in alignment with the bayesian framework however we did find a main effect of expectation uh, a much bigger effect so for each unit increase in expectation uh, pain actually changes of 0 0.25 so it's a much larger effect i mean this is not so surprising given that uh, there is a lot of literature showing the link in between expectation and pain. Um, however, we did find a bit surprising that the Bayesian factor that we reported here actually found the model without the interaction to be a better model than the model with just expectations. Um, and this is quite surprising for us, but at the same time, um, our uh, um, reflection on this is that our data 
it's it's better described by the model with just the expectation. However, um, the interaction adds um, a, let, let's say adds more details on the quality of these in, of these effective expectations. Um, and I will go back to his, to this in the limitation section. However, um, because we kept the noxious stimuli fixed, which is a strength of the study because it allows us to isolate the prior. This also means that the relationship between pain and expectation is particularly strong because we give always the same noxious stimulus. So this is one of our um, suggestions for why this effect might be covering the interaction effect. So to conclude on this slide, um, what we did find with this analysis is that there is a small but consistent interaction effect supporting the Bayesian framework for, for, for our data. And yeah, so what we found is that the greater the precision, the stronger the relationship between expectation and pain, as evident from, from the graph here. Okay, so let's move on to our second main analysis, looking at delta pain and whether this is predicted by expectation precision. So as you can see, both from the image and from the graph uh, and from the table, what we see is that we have a 95% um, probability that for each unit increase in precision, for each unit decrease in precision, um, delta pain actually decreases. So what this means in simpler terms is that the more confident I am in my expectation, the smaller the mismatch between what I expect and what I perceive. So the more alignment between my prior and, and my percept, which is exactly what we would expect from a Bayesian perspective. So this second analysis strongly support the Bayesian framework and gives us also more um, insight into our previous analysis, supporting that that interaction effect, despite being small, it's there and it's present. And the Bayesian, fra uh, the Bayesian factor here um, favors model one against model two quite a lot. So the model with the precision is better than the null model. Of course, the limitation here is that with not having the interaction effect, we compare this model with the null model. So it's a lot bigger, um, but yeah. So what we concluded from here is that there is a strong and consistent main effect of expectation precision, and that the higher the precision, the lower the mismatch. So just to uh, conclude with some discussion points, um, what we found in our study is that placebo hypalgesia and nocebo hyperalgesia can be unified under the same Bayesian predictive model and so what we found is that the greater the expectation precision, the greater the alignment between the expected and the perceived pain. So again, here comes our image that moves. So what we found here basically is exactly this movement. So the sensory data was kept fixed, but the posterior moves towards the prior, the more the prior becomes certain. So here, um, our data aligns with um, previous evidence, both the direct and indirect one that I presented at the beginning. We extended um, these findings. So we extended that the Bayesian framework is a good model uh, using verbal manipulation. As I was mentioning before, most of the direct and indirect evidence that I outlined at the beginning actually used um, a conditioning manipulation to elicit placebo and nocebo responses, whereas here we focus on the verbal manipulation. And the reason why I'm focusing on this part is because Mm, eliciting placebo and nocebo effects with verbal manipulation is not the same thing of eliciting it with the conditioning. And this is particularly true when we talk about Bayesian framework. In fact, if we, if we think about it, if we use verbal manipulation, we interact with the prior at the higher up level. So we are ac accessing cognition to modulate the prior by telling someone, look, this has analgesic or hyperalgesic hyper properties. However, when we use conditioning, it's slightly different because we are not just using verbal suggestions, but we are actually modulating the sensory data. So we are altering the, the incoming information. So from a Bayesian perspective, that's quite different because we are changing the, the inputs um, that actually are going to modulate the prior. So there is actually a nice um, review on this topic by Milde in 2023, and you can see it in the reference list. Uh, that it's quite interesting. Uh, then we extend, so our data extend uh, the Bayesian framework to nocebo hyperalgesia. Uh, in fact, this is the first time that the model has been tested on nocebo um, hyperalgesia. We extended it to a higher up level. So again, this is the first time this has been done in placebo and nocebo areas. Uh, this has been done in Cubase experiments, but never in placebo and nocebo. 
And finally, we unified placebo analgesia and nocebo analgesia under the same model, which should not be taken for granted. In fact, as some of you might know, um, research shows that placebo analgesia and nocebo analgesia often have very different phenotypical responses. So for example, placebo analgesia is a bit harder to elicit, nocebo analgesia is a bit easier to elicit, and as well, um, placebo analgesia tends to um, extinguish earlier than nocebo analgesia. So these phenotypical differences um, are present, but by unifying these two phenomena under the same model, what we know now is that these differences should not be um, should not that do not stem from differences in the mechanical in the mechanics underneath the processes, but can be due to differences in the way the prior and the sensory data are integrated one with the other. Here, of course, our study has several limitations, and there are um, several things that should be outlined. So, for example. Um, our data and our analysis are kept at the descriptive level. So we are just describing the interplay between the prior and the sensory data and the percept. Um, so we cannot infer causality from this study specifically. Um, indeed, to infer causality, we should replicate a similar design, uh, but this time modulating expectation confidence and measuring um, yeah, the prior and its confidence. So doing something a bit more similar to the experiment um, I presented at the beginning um, with the indirect evidence while also measuring the prior dimensions. Um, again, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we kept the noxious stimuli fixed, which indeed is a strength of our experiment because it allowed us to focus on the prior and its dimension. However, we do not inform you don't we don't have information on the role of the noxious um stimuli and its variants. So future studies should indeed modulate um, the noxious stimulus. Uh, also, we um, ended up choosing an unsuitable uh, physiological marker, peak-to-peak um, -peak response just reported habituation. So future studies should consider replicate this data using different neurophysiological measures. For example, EEG seems to be a pretty good one um, from research coming from Q-based designs. And finally, this, is, this data is based on artificial pain elicited on healthy individuals, which is a fantastic starting point. But then, of course, we want to extend these to chronic pain patients in order to apply these findings to, to real life scenarios. Um, and gladly, we are actually collecting data uh, on these now, looking at how expectation um, and its precision can predict fluctuations in ecological pain in chronic pain patients. So just a quick word on the clinical implications, um, what these data suggest, and hopefully uh, future research that will contribute to this search, uh, is that a new potential target for therapeutic interventions could actually be expectation precision, which in turn um, influence expectation and treatment outcome. So, so far, we mainly focus on expectations, and we know that working on them can have a big impact on treatment outcome. Uh, but a new um, idea would be to actually focus on expectation precision. So, for example, if a patient is a very has an expectation uh, about a treatment or, or about its pain, it might not be great to try to change its expectations to start with. But first, we might want to focus on how certain, how confident is this person in their expectation. And then from there, first trying to modify the expectation precision and then try to change the expectation. So this is just a, an idea from some future clinical implications. And I would like to thank um, everyone that collaborated to this work, specifically Daniele Romano, which is my past uh, PI supervisor, and Giorgia, to Giorgia Tosi, who are both uh, directly involved in this project, and also all my other collaborators that I've been working with throughout these research years. Here is the reference list. I'm happy to share this at the end of the talk if you are interested in further readings. And I would like to thank you for your attention.